Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it is my great honor to uh, begin this session on harm reduction and in uh, such a uh, knowledgeable and uh, engaged uh, company here on the stage. I tried to add all the years of each of them uh, being active in drug policy and we are far, far above 100 years. Uh, if we add, add all what was done in research, in advocacy, in teaching, in uh, reforming uh, drug policy and uh, trying to uh, make the people aware about what can be done. We are here at the AIDS conference and uh, it is always astonishing to me after 10 years being uh, the responsible for public health in Switzerland in the worst year, if I can say so, of the epidemic, uh, but also in the good years of reforms and introducing new measures, uh, I am always astonished to think about how efficient, how cheap, how, um, yes, efficient and cheap and, and humane are the means to prevent the uh, explosion of the VI, uh, HIV, how easy it is to inform the population about what they can do to protect themselves, to protect their beloved one, to protect their environment, to protect their life and their health. I mean, making propaganda for Candom, as I, I did it in a time where in my country it was not nice to speak about sexuality, or promoting harm reduction, is so something so obvious. It is uh, really helping so many people that I am always astonished about the difficulty to bring it uh, to the uh, political uh, decision makers and to the public uh, opinion. But it is our duty to do so, and this is the reason why in this panel we will speak about harm uh, reduction. Just one sentence more. Drugs can be harmful. They are a commodity that is risky in the consumption, as many other commodity, com commodities are. But uh, the risk is really a risk that is linked to the consumption of this uh, uh, product, and this risk can be diminished in a reasonable way to use drugs. But the risk of failed drug policy, which obliged people not to protect themselves, which obliged people to get hidden in the uh, worst places of a city, uh, false policy who are uh, avoiding the people or uh, impeding the people to have access to the services they need, these policies are making more harm than the substance itself. And harm reduction is the answer not only to the harm of drugs, but it is really also a response to the harm of failed drug policies. So let us begin with this uh, uh, panel. Let me first of all present my co-chair, uh, John Peter Kuhls. I think he is one of the of those who brings more, z more years in the, uh, in the addition I, I, I did some uh, before. I think you are 40 years now in, uh, in the fight. Uh, very close. <laughs> well, I, I think you are close to 40. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you are really one of the first to develop here in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, HIV prevention, and uh, you developed uh, also the information about this. Since 1995, uh, you are now uh, working internationally also, bringing your knowledge all over the world, and not only in the field of uh, uh, the response on harm reduction, but in criminal justice, law, inform, in law enforcement, penal system, and so on. So thank you so much for sharing this, uh, and I uh, will, if you agree, go immediately to our first speaker, Julia Buxton, from Hungary, if I can say so, and we know that uh, her position is a difficult one as a teacher in the uh, East European University in Budapest. Julia Buxton is a specialist of drug policy 
And uh, when I was trying to know since when, I see that the uh, first book on drug policy were written or published uh, in 2010, but I think it is the result of a long work you did before. So, Julia, you have the floor. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for attending the session. Um, my role is to, in essence, set the scene for the broader discussion of the panel. And I was asked to look at drug use worldwide um, and HIV. And the real emphasis that I want to place in this um, presentation is the problem that we have in terms of the reliability of drug use data. And in order to understand this, I think you need to frame this as a critique of the system of international drug control that we have. This may be very basic for some of you, but for those of you who aren't familiar with the model of international drug control, this is now over, essentially, a century. It's over 100 years old that we've had this model, um, this approach to the control of drugs, essentially emerging out of a, a trade model for the regulation of opium. And so we, we're working with a model in terms of how we regulate access to drugs that was essentially devised during a period of empire and when women couldn't vote or wear trousers, and we're still working with this approach today. And the fundamentals of this approach is based on criminalization of certain substances. There's a big debate around the types of substances that fall within the control regime. And the model is one which hinges on criminalization. So essentially, the stigmatization of people who use those drugs, um, which are classified as being harmful under the drug regime. The approach is focused on law enforcement, specifically on law enforcement, and the measurements of success in drug policy are overwhelmingly quantitative. They're based on statistics. They're based on volumes, arrests, seizures, flows. So it's very, very simplistic data. The metrics of how we monitor and evaluate international drug policy are arcane and hugely simplistic. In essence, what happens in international drug control is that the UNODC and countries measure what they treasure. They don't measure the impacts of drug policy. And this is unlike many other areas of public policy, if we're talking about environment, if we're talking about transport, education, where we've seen the development of very, very complicated methods for monitoring and evaluating policy, we simply do not use this in drug policy. So as a result, we have very poor data through which we are meant to evaluate policy and programming. So the context here is how do we do research? How do we understand the number of people who are using drugs in the context of criminalization? How do we work with these hidden populations? How do we get true information? As I say here in this bottom, uh, bottom bullet here, how do we really understand the nature and the extent of drug use when we're working in countries where drug use is criminalized? People are not going to give you honest and truthful answers. People don't know the volume and the quantity and the purity of the drugs they're probably using. It's very difficult to capture people over time. So the methods and the information that we have are very, very weak. This is a fundamental flaw in this international system. What we also see, if you've had a look at the UNODC 2018 World Drug Report, is we have enormous gaps in our knowledge. For Africa, for example, the UNODC simply surmises that we have insufficient data or data hasn't been submitted by countries. So we have these enormous vacuums in our knowledge and understanding of what's actually happening in terms of drug use. Another point that I would like to make here is because this system is over a century old, I would argue we have a bias towards very robust monitoring of, for example, the number of hectares that are under coca cultivation or hectares that are under opium poppy cultivation, a really heavy and intense focus on organic drugs. Conversely, synthetic drugs, which are now really the kind of surge in use that we're seeing, have always been treated infinitely more lax way than what we see in the treatment of organics. And I would argue that this comes down to a north-south bias in international control. So according to the data of the 2018 World Drug Report, we have 275 million people uh, who have used drugs at least once in 2016, a completely useless statistic which tells us absolutely nothing whatsoever. 
What is interesting here is that we have 275 million people who are allegedly and admitting to using drugs once, despite criminalisation, despite one of my colleagues will be talking about incarceration rates, despite the fact you can lose your life, you lose your family, lose your children, lose your job, this is having no downward effect on overall levels of drug use. 31 million people apparently suffer from a drug use disorder. But again, if you look at this statistic, this is actually a very, very small minority of the overall numbers of people who admit to using drugs. But of these 31 million, according to the UNODC, we only have one in six people who are actually in treatment. And we have a real issue with gender here. I'm trying to do work on the gendered impacts of drug policy and the paucity of data around women, women's drug use, and the impacts of counter-narcotics policies on women is hugely underexplored. So just in terms of the data, again, from the UNODC, as you can see, it's hardly a track record of success. We're really nowhere near any goal, utopian goal of, of zero drugs. But the key driver here, which I think is particularly important, is looking at this surge in synthetic drug use. But we have a very repressive attitude. The international system is very repressive towards the whole kind of trade and use in terms of heroin, morphine, opiates, and also cocaine. But look at the figures for cocaine, 17 million people annually, and look at the destruction wrought through efforts to suppress the cocaine trade. Now, in particular, I just want to focus on people who inject drugs, an estimated 10.6 million. Allegedly, again, we have no idea whatsoever. But according to the UNODC, half of these people are located in just three countries, China, Russia, and the United States. You have the figures here, one in eight living with HIV. But really kind of reinforcing this problem that we have with the lack of data, information, and access to treatment, we only have 79 countries which are operating needle and syringe programs or opiate substitute therapy. Only four countries in the world have the level of provision for people who are injecting drug users in order to prevent HIV. Only four countries globally. 162 countries report they provide no information to injecting drug users on antiretroviral therapy. And when you look here in terms of the scale of the prevalence of HIV in the drug injecting community, you'll see that we have a key population which is marginalised, stigmatised and does not have access to the type of services required. And in context of criminalisation, this is manifestly increasing the risk to these populations and to the related chains. Now, as we just work through this very quickly, the slides will be available. The Lancet 2017 report here demonstrating really the, the poor level of provision um, in terms of reaching out to people and providing the kind of harm reduction services essential to prevent and contain the risk of HIV infection. And in particular here, something which has to be emphasized is even if we are providing these kinds of services in the context of criminalization, they simply cannot be accessed by these populations. I live in Hungary, currently working in Hungary, and you'll see Eastern Europe, as you're um, probably very well aware, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where we have seen in particular the rollback of, in some countries like Hungary, initially progressive programs. What we're seeing now is a re-emphasis on criminalization, a re-emphasis on undermining some of the important and positive work that was done on harm reduction, Eurasian Harm Reduction Coalition, these kinds of organizations, this is now being pushed back by strategies of recriminalization. And as a result of this, what we're seeing is that Eastern Europe and Central Asia are actually pushing the international community away from targets on reducing HIV simply because of a more repressive attitude to criminalizing of drugs, of gay relationships, and in turn, marginalizing and stigmatizing these communities. This is very quickly here just um, a graph from uh, the Eastern Europe Central Asian region and you'll see that in terms of the prevalence new infection rates this is 51% of this population is the drug injecting community. So the final slides here this is what the World Drug Report itself acknowledged given the hidden and stigmatized nature of injecting drug use it's extremely challenging to arrive at accurate and valid population size estimates and the prevalence of HIV among people who inject drugs. And we will not be able to make progress on addressing this situation for as long as we remain within a context of criminalization. And to finish before handing over, I would emphasize this in a broader context of drug policy failure. 
that we're not simply talking about being unable to reach out to hidden populations, hidden communities, that we're putting more people at risk through strategies of criminalization and this criminalization approach, we have to understand that 100 years of drug policy has simply not worked. The 2018 World Drug Report, global opium production up 65%, global cocaine manufacture up 56%. This would be a phenomenal record if it was not for the fact they were trying to achieve the reverse. So I'll hand over to my other colleagues. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for this uh, very clear introduction to the dimension, as far it is known, of our issue. I give now the floor to Daniel Holloy. Dan Daniel Holloy is an activist in human rights from uh, Mexico, a senior policy advisor in the law and policy program at Amnesty International. He had made a lot, I think, in Mexico, and uh, uh, he was a part of the civil society group that worked together with the Mexican Congress in drafting the Mexican law for the protection of human rights defenders and journalists. Uh, Daniel, you have the floor. What? I'm not using slides. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the invitation. It is a real honor for me to be here today. Um, I will be speaking today of how prohibitionist policies have led to increasing rates of violence and human rights violations and have in time contributed to the spread of HIV. In several countries around the world, from my country in Mexico to Brazil and the Philippines, the so-called war on drugs has taken a very real dimension. In this and other countries, Prohibitionist and other repressive policies have translated into the, a declared government policy that it is militarized, lethal, and extremely bloody. The militarization of law enforcement as part of domestic drug control efforts has led to alarming levels of violence and human rights violations, having devastating effects on many families and communities around the world, particularly affecting the poorest and most marginalized sectors of society. People who use drugs have been punished, demonized, and stigmatized in so many countries, either as a misguided strategy to deter others from using drugs, or simply as a facade to distract people from other pressing issues. But according to international standards, the use of, of the military to carry out policing functions, including drug enforcement operations, must be exceptional and only limited to those serious circumstances where it is impossible for the authorities to rely solely on civilian law enforcement agencies. But drug prohibition has inverted the exception and made it the rule in so many countries. Drug enforcement operations have often favored the use of force by the security forces based on the premise that national security or public safety is at stake. Several countries have deployed the army to the streets to conduct drug enforcement operations or have adopted military techniques, training, and equipment to the use of the police. All too often, security forces deployed in drug enforcement operations are using lethal force as the first answer, in many cases leading to extrajudicial executions. In the most extreme cases, as has been pointed out in the Philippines, the situation may amount to crimes against humanity, where the International Criminal Court is already conducting a preliminary investigation. An Amnesty International research conducted last year in the Philippines documented hit lists arbitrarily drawn up by politicians that included thousands of people suspected of using drugs. The police has admitted that has killed at least 4,000 people since President Duterte declared the war on drugs in 2016 in what they have frequently justified as being in self-defense. In other cases, the police have recruited paid killers to conduct the dirty the dirty work for them. We are now seeing with great concern how this devastating policy is being praised and replicated in many other countries in the region. In Indonesia, the number of police killings has skyrocketed since last year. Just in the last three weeks, the regional police forces in Jakarta and other major cities have already killed at least 15 people and injured 41 others. The alarming race in unlawful killings by the police 
comes amidst an increasing narrative where the authorities are advocating for tougher measures to address drug-related crime. The wave of unlawful killings has also reached Bangladesh in the wake of a nationwide crackdown on alleged drug offenders, which began in May last year, this year. Nearly 200 deaths have been reported at the hands of a special police force conducting anti-drug operations. While the police has argued that these deaths were a result of gun violence, some relatives of the deceased claim the victims were taken from their homes by law enforcement officials and then executed. We saw how violence spiraled as well in Mexico shortly after President Calderon declared the war on drugs in 2006 and ordered a military offensive against the drug cartels, a strategy that eventually led tens of thousands of troops to the streets. But far from reducing the power of organized crime and addressing the problems of drug trafficking, violence and insecurity remain a source of intense concern. Some estimates suggest that many as 200,000 people have been killed in violence linked to organized crime. The deployment of the armed forces to combat organized crime in Mexico has led to a sharp and sustained increase in human rights violations from cases of torture and forced disappearances and extrajudicial executions. You might have heard of the enforced disappearance of 43 students in the state of Guerrero in southern Mexico, one of the most emblematic cases of what the war on drugs has brought to a country in which the boundaries between organized crime and the state are ever more blurred. One night in September 2014, students from a rural school had planned to take part in a demonstration in Mexico City. On their way, they were stopped by the police and other unidentified men and, and, and were shot at. A number of students they, ran, they tried to run away and escape the buses, but some of them were detained and forcibly disappeared. Almost four years after, we still don't know where they are. No one has been sanctioned for this crime, and the authorities still in, in, insist on their version that the students were killed and burned in a, in a local rubbish dump by a drug cartel, a theory that has been proven to be scientifically, scientifically impossible by independent experts of the Inter-American Human Rights Commission. And this is only one of the more than 34,000 cases of, of people who remain disappeared in Mexico. In some instances, militarized operations repeatedly target whole communities, disrupting provision of local services and resulting in additional violations of a range of economic, social, and cultural rights, including the rights to health, education, and work. During an investigation we conducted in Brazil, we heard from many people living in the favelas and other poor neighborhoods of the particular risks children were facing in order to get to school, who many times find themselves in the crossfire. We heard from example from employees in a, com in a community nursery in the favela of Akari, which was caught on several occasions in the midst of clashes between the police and armed gangs. In one single month, the nursery was closed on three different occasions due to police operations, causing also many of the mothers to lose days of work. Violence has also reached children. In Mexico, Brazil, and Colombia, children and young people have been recruited by armed groups involved in drug trafficking to being engaged in, in a range of activities, from trade and selling drugs to surveillance, or are even sent to the clashes with the security forces. Girls are also being recruited by criminal groups, mostly to act as drug couriers or, to have, or, or have been sexually abused, forced to marry, trafficked, and exploited. The, level of, the levels of violence driven by prohibition and re other repressive policies are also taking a clear toll on the right to health and have, have contributed to the spread of HIV and hepatitis C. Many studies have documented how drug law enforcement and police crackdown lead to riskier and more harmful practices, including needle sharing and rushed injections. The rushed preparation of drugs to avoid detection has also increased the risk of overdose and new infections. Studies have also shown how the criminalization of drugs and other repressive policies deter people from seeking and accessing healthcare and restrict the availability of harm reduction services. As has already been mentioned, sharing needles and other drug equipment is the most widespread route of new transmissions of HIV among people who use drugs. We saw this as well in the Philippines, where even before President Duterte came to power, there were already in place restrictive laws that curtailed harm reduction efforts and contributed to the spread of HIV. But since the war on drugs began in that country, the authorities have also cracked down on clean needle and syringe exchange programs, and people told us how these policies 
have driven people who use drugs and people living with HIV further underground, creating more barriers to crucial prevention, treatment, and harm reduction services. Education and health workers are being extremely cautious because they are afraid they can be incarcerated. Even health checkups of people who live with HIV and distribution of, of free condoms have stopped out of fear of the authorities. Several people who use drugs also told us that the crackdown has caused prices of syringes and drugs to go up, forcing them to rely on riskier behaviors. Let me just finalize by adding one last remark of how the violence led by prohibition is also affecting efforts in so ma of, of so many activists defending human rights worldwide. From journalists who have revealed the collusion between the authorities and organized crime, to human rights defenders exposing abuses committed by the, drug, by the security forces, to, drug, to doctors and healthcare providers, and drug policy activists challenging drug control. All are facing increasing risks and challenges driven by current drug policies. In a context of a shrinking space for civil society, where human rights defenders are facing increasing threats and attacks worldwide, the so-called war on drugs has been a particular driver of human rights violations against human rights defenders, including harassment, intimidation, ill treatment, prosecution, and arbitrary detention simply for defending human rights. Thousands have been killed or even forcibly disappeared. But it is precisely thanks to so many brave human rights defenders, like all of you here today, that shows that finding a new way is possible. It was just a couple of weeks ago that Amnesty International representatives from around the world came together and took the decision for the organization to work towards more compassionate drug policies, shifting away from prohibition towards an approach that puts the protection of people's health and rights at the center. We are really thrilled to be joining this community of inspiring human rights defenders to work to end the war on drugs that has left a legacy of abuse, violence, and suffering. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Now another Daniel will take the floor, Daniel Wolf. Daniel Wolf, I think, is the, perhaps the person most uh, known here in this uh, area. Uh, he is the Director of International Harm Reduction Development at the Public Health Program of the Open Society Foundation and uh, he has a long history also of activism and research. Daniel, you have the word. Thank you, Ruth, and thanks to all of you. Uh, I wanted to return us to uh, what might be a slightly more conventional area of, of thinking about harm reduction and HIV prevention, but also to make some links with my colleagues who have uh, come before. It's, it's tempting at conferences like this one to answer what I would call the glass half full, glass half empty questions, usually by counting and thinking about, for example, the number of countries, 90, who offer needle and syringe programming, or thinking about the coverage, quite low, of either the people who have adequate access to needles or of opioid substitution treatment or antiretroviral treatment. Um, or even, as in a study that is a, quite an important study that was released earlier here this week about money for harm reduction, and I do hope everyone will focus on this slide because it's the corollary to Julia's slide that showed increasing HIV infections in regions with uh, concentrated epidemics among people who inject drugs. And unfortunately, we are seeing decreasing funding at precisely the moment when this is occurring. But I also did want to ask us not to focus on how much is in the glass, but rather on what we think of as falling inside or outside the frame of what deserves to be counted. Uh, I think that often in harm reduction, even in countries that we regard as making progress or having best practice, that much of our thinking and framing is shaped by a number of biases that even for someone like me trained in public health or many of you who regard themselves as working in public health and not implicated in the drug control efforts that Daniel just described, that in some ways there are uh, links that we sometimes don't see. They may be clear as glass, but they are present. And I want to just talk about three framing biases that I think we need to think about moving forward in harm reduction. The first is what I would call the control and contain bias, 
where we often treat drug users almost like drugs themselves as something to be monitored and carefully regulated. So when, for example, we ask people at needle exchange programs to present their ID cards, or when we, in uh, behavioral risk surveys or methadone programs, propose using fingerprints or iris scans or other biometrics, when we maintain registries of patients that are shared by law and practice with the police, or even if they're not, the truth is that these are practices very resonant and familiar with the negative lived experience of people who use drugs. And so even though we think we're doing health interventions, it's health interventions in the form of or impacted by the legacy of drug control. Sometimes even our language, we, we, we as public health specialists hear it one way. People on the ground who have used drugs and have been subject to the way that government responds hear it in a different way. So this is universal testing. Um, the left-hand part of the slide is Thailand, where police set up roadblocks and test the urine of every single passenger in every single car. The right is a Russian nightclub where similarly people come over the walls and will test everyone for drug use. Those who test positive will have their ad names added to lists. They risk loss of child custody, loss of driver's license, etc. cetera. Uh, we talk about disease surveillance, but this is surveillance. The left-hand slide is uh, police uh, checking for evidence of drug injection of a drug user in Mexico. The right is China. Every drug user has their identity as a drug user coded to their national ID card. If you present at a hotel, at an internet cafe, your ID card, the police arrive within half an hour to drug test you. Uh, this is treatment for all in China, but it could be many different countries where on the basis of a positive urine test alone, not an evaluation of your addiction severity or need, you are placed for one year or two years, in this case, in a facility where your, quote, treatment is laboring without pay, sometimes contracted by private industry, uh, for up to 13 hours a day in this facility, uh, making goods for the tourist trade in many facilities where you're asked to work in total silence. A second bias, and I've been very struck by it at this conference, I think has to do with our ambivalence about the frailties and complexity of human behavior, whether that is drug use or sexuality. And it's the bias in favor of biotechnologies. So whether you are at addiction conferences now in the US, where people are talking about this new device placed behind the ear to mitigate withdrawal symptoms from opioids, or at this conference you're talking about PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, uh, there is a kind of fantasy that the technology will answer what we have found difficult to answer in our engagement with patients or people who need services. The irony for me is that, as Ruth said at the beginning, actually harm reduction, and particularly needle and syringe exchange and provision of clean supplies for injecting, is an incredibly effective biotechnology. We know this. It's cheap. It works. In a number of countries, infections have been reduced to zero. And yet we also know that it's not as simple as having the technology, that in fact neither pills nor needles leap uh, uncontrolled into people's hands, that you actually need human engagement to shape uh, the service delivery. And for me, the most interesting part of the PrEP study that was done in Thailand around uh, injecting drug use and pre-exposure prophylaxis was not necessarily the protective effect of the tenofovir, but rather how, when you are committed to doing it, how many people you can reach and how few are lost to follow up. They followed people with this medicine into prison, into drug detention. They paid people to come in to receive the service, and they had incredible retention rates. And I think it's a very important lesson for us. You can retain and reach people if you are committed to doing it, and not only in a clinical trial. The third framing bias, and this is very present for us, and I understand this is an AIDS conference, is around HIV and abstinence from drugs as the only outcomes of interest. And of course, I completely share the interest in eradication or reduction of HIV and hepatitis C and the importance of treatment. But the reality is that for many, many drug users, life is complicated and HIV and hepatitis C are not the primary outcomes of interest or even the primary preoccupations. And our harm reduction intervention should not only be geared to these either overdose and the use of naloxone to prevent it, methamphetamine use, 
increasingly, we have all of these HIV-focused interventions and do not wish to acknowledge that, for example, in many countries, one-third of methadone users are now using stimulants or that stimulant use is actually happening with all of the same drop-in centers and yet people feel unable to address it. The police and negotiations with the police, mob justice, pregnancy, all of these things are critical concerns for people who use drugs and often left out of what we define as the harm reduction package. I also think we have things to learn from these. For example, public health people, we often refer to drug users as a hard to reach population. The police have very little difficulty in reaching them. It's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting lesson for us. Uh, just a note on the future, because I was, this is supposed to be titled Harm Reduction at the Crossroads, that increasingly we are seeing uh, at certain things that join a number of these biases. I'm particularly thinking of new medicines and new technologies that are long-acting formulations, often advanced in the name of patient convenience, uh, but often also reinforcing provider or government control. So on the left-hand side, you see Vivitrol. This is an opioid blockade. It's, uh, it's injected. It, it is a long-acting. It lasts for a month, each injection. Um, we also now have buprenorphine implants and buprenorphine injections. And uh, soon we will be hearing more about long-acting injectable ART. And all of these things are incredibly important and potentially useful tools in uh, efforts to control addiction and HIV. But it's also really important to remember that naltrexone uh, for example, is 100 times more expensive than methadone or buprenorphine, and increasingly being uh, engaged, considered by countries that have often said they can't afford harm reduction. So I'm thinking, you know, this is increasingly popular in the U.S., but coming soon to a country near you, I've seen sales representatives in Malaysia and Vietnam, uh, much interest, and interestingly, uh, these companies are skipping the positions and marketing directly to law enforcement and judges uh, and so this is also an interesting and difficult point, which is when the criminal justice system bleeds with the health system and the, the medicine is the, is the technology that allows that bleeding. And I hope we are uh, all conscious of that as we move forward. Let me close, I know time is short, just by saying that I think if we return to basics, it would help us as, at, at this point, moment in harm reduction, which is not framing it simply as uh, a, a set of HIV or hepatitis C interventions or a 10-point list that WHO and UNODC and UNAIDS puts forward to us, but really starting with people and asking drug users what it is that is most concerning to them and how it is we can build the therapeutic alliance with them I think what this leads to is a number of innovative harm reduction practices that fall outside the traditional package, but really uh, could be the subject of another presentation and an important one. I'm thinking of, for example, interventions on the dark net about harm reduction. The dark net increasingly used for drug purchases in Eastern Europe, harm reduction information in that context. I'm thinking also of, um, for example, self-testing and case management in Ukraine that, that engages people in HIV testing before they engage with government systems that might be unfriendly. There are many other examples, but increasingly starting with the people rather than the list is the key. And I think if we do do that, then rather than a, perhaps a, a stagnant glass of water and ba barriers that we no longer see, we can arrive at a system that is much more dynamic much more changeable over time, much more responsive to people's needs, and much more powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Daniel. I give now immediately the, word, uh, the floor to Neve Eastwood. Neve is uh, Executive uh, Director of Release, the UK Centers of Expertise on Drugs and Drug Law. Uh, you co-authored uh, the two recent policy papers from release, the numbers in black and white, ethnic disparities in the policing and prosecuting prosecution of drug offenses in England and Wales, and a quiet revolution, drug decriminalization policies across the world. Come on to the floor and give us the hope that uh, your last report is uh, in the title. 
Okay, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, and good morning to you all, and thank you for coming to this in session today. It's important that drug policy is really addressed within the HIV and AIDS community. You will see my title is The War on Drugs is a War on People Unless You Are Rich and White. Um, I've been asked to talk about social control, about how our drug laws are a form of social control that targets certain groups in society, and also about how we can pursue legal reform to provide better environments for uh, people who use drugs. Um, <clears throat> across the world, it is communities of color and people living in poverty who are the target of the drug war. This is driving HIV transmission rates amongst these population. The US has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. Where African Americans are six, six times more likely to be imprisoned for a drugs offense um, compared to the white population, and despite the fact that black people use drugs at a similar rate to white people, and also um, that dealing is largely similar between the different uh, racial populations. One in four Americans with HIV will go through the prison system annually. And when we think about how mass incarceration in the US is driven by drug policing and drug law enforcement, it's very easy to see the connection between the spread of HIV in the US and the repression of the black community through the drug laws. Um, as a result of the mass incarceration of African Americans, African Americans have a higher rate of HIV, um, where they make up 12% of the US population, but 50% of newly diagnosed HIV cases in the US. And it's not just the US where this is a problem. Across the global north, we see communities of color, in particular black communities, targeted by the drug laws, whether it be France, whether it be Canada, other European countries. Research that we have done at my organization looked at the policing and law enforcement of drug offenses um, in England and Wales. And what we found was that black people are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched for drugs despite using drugs at a lower rate than the white population. Added to this, we were able, these are maps that I'm going to show you from uh, London. So these are the boroughs of London. Um, and what this kind of demonstrates is the idea of drug laws as a form of social control, where we can see the intensity of stop and search for drugs occurring in areas of deprivation. It is the inner city areas of Hackney, of Tar Hamlets, where we have high levels of deprivation across multiple indices, where people are being targeted through drug laws, where 60% of all police stop and searches are for drug suspected drug offences, primarily possession offences and primarily cannabis. So this is a way of controlling communities. And again, with the racial disparity, we can see in the affluent areas of London, for example, in areas like Richmond and Kingston, where we have very low rates of stop and search for drugs, so we don't have that intensity that seeks to go after the poorest in our communities. But what we have is high levels of racial disparity. So where we see that it's black people who are being targeted in these affluent communities, being pushed out. And as Daniel has pointed out in his presentation, it is communities in countries like the Philippines where Duterte's war is raged against those living in poverty, 20,000 dead in the last two years. This is not targeting everybody in society. This is targeting the poorest. And the same in Rio where we see in the favelas that nine out of 10 extrajudicial killings were, um, or nine out of 10 police killings were considered to be extrajudicial killings. Um, and drug use is ubiquitous in society. It's not confined to those groups. Lots of people use drugs. People from all walks of life, um, including politicians. So we've had three previous uh, US presidents. There could be arguments that this president should have used drugs too. Um, we've also seen dictators such as Duterte, elected dictators, authoritarians such as Duterte, admitting to his own fentanyl use, albeit being uh, it was prescribed. But the point is, these people know that drugs aren't necessarily bad or dangerous. They have their own experiences of it. So why do they continue to promote these hypocrisy, um, this hypocrisy in the policies? Well, I think it suits them. 
I think it suits them to other groups in society, to make certain groups, such as people who use drugs, especially people who inject drugs, and migrants, the others in society, so that communities blame those people for their problems, and that the police other these people, that health treatment services, sometimes other these people, they're seen as separate from the mainstream. And so therefore, rather than holding those in power to account, it is these people who are blamed. Thankfully, we are seeing reforms around the world that do seem to provide legal environments where we're getting better results. And this is largely as a result of decriminalization. And decriminalization is the ending of criminal sanctions for possession offenses. So our report that we launched in 2016 looked at 25 countries across the globe that had taken this uh, policy decision. Many of them do it very badly, but I want to focus on the guys that do it well. So you all have heard that Portugal decriminalized drug possession offenses back in 2001. And what we've seen since that time is a, vol a fall in problematic use, a fall in young people transitioning from uh, drugs such as cannabis to heroin and cocaine, a fall in injecting drug use, a 40% fall in injecting drug use in the first 10 years of the policy. Important to recognize that was coupled with significant investment in harm reduction services. We've also seen a significant decrease in drug-related deaths, where Portugal has one of the lowest rates of drug-related deaths in Europe. And that's important. In the UK, we have a crisis around drug-related deaths. It's not as bad as the US, but we're going in that direction. And criminalization contributes to that. And importantly, HIV. This is Portugal's figures from 2001 to 2012. We can see in 2001 it was over 1,000 diagnoses of newly diagnosed HIV cases. We're now below 100. That's pretty astounding. That's decriminalization married with harm reduction that's achieved this effect. Just some other highlights from other countries. The Czech Republic undertook a cost-benefit analysis of the criminal justice approach to drug possession back in 2002. And that research found that penalization, criminalization of drug use had not affected availability, it had not affected prevalence, but it had increased the social costs associated with the drugs trade and with drug use. And so they decriminalized all drugs back in 2010. Another piece of research that I think is incredibly important looks at the experience of individuals who are criminalized in states in Australia where cannabis, for example, is decriminalized, where it's a civil offense, not a criminal offense, um, against those who are criminalized for the same activity. And it found that there were negative outcomes for those criminalized uh, in terms of their employment, their accommodation, and their relationships. But importantly, also it found that those who are criminalized were much more likely to come back into contact with the criminal justice system. So if you like, drug possession offenses are a gateway into the criminal justice system. And we know when people reoffend, there's a higher likelihood of them going to prison. And we know that prison is potentially the worst environment for, um, the, uh, for the health of individuals and a driver for HIV transmission. The UN family across the world support decriminalization. And just to say that if we are to meet the goal of reducing or eliminating AIDS by 2030, we must address the most egregious elements of drug policy. We must support and fight against extrajudicial killings. We must end police surveillance of people who use drugs. And not just police surveillance, but the surveillance that Daniel was talking about in health settings. We must end mass incarceration. And when we talk about decriminalization, we should also advocate not just for an end of criminal sanctions for personal possession, but the ending of criminalization of other actors within the trade, actors who are driven there by their own drug use, by economic desperation, and by um, crop the, their, their cultural normal um, experience of producing uh, drugs such as cocaine and heroin, coca and opium. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Our last speaker is Judy Chang. I think everybody is also knowing uh, Judy. Uh, she has uh, 20 years of activism, you see? 
Judy Chang, for those who no, do not uh, uh, know her, is the executive director of the International Network of People Who Use Drugs. You have the floor. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so, just an introduction to INPUD, the International Network of People Who Use Drugs. We're a global peer-based network of people who use drugs that aim to protect our health and defend our rights. So, the title of this session, Drugs, Drug Policy, Harm Reduction, a Reality Check, got me thinking about a recent panel I was on where panelists were asked to reflect on whether we should be optimistic or pessimistic about prospects for progressive drug policy reform. So among the panelists, there was a schism about whether there was cause for hope or alarm. Panelists from UN agencies and NGOs based on the global north were more optimistic. So they were pointing to the inclusion of human rights language within the UNGAS 2016 outcome document, as well as um, the realities of cannabis regulation, decriminalization models, and drug consumption rooms. But for people who use drugs, or from the perspective of people who use drugs, we see the problem, obviously, from a much more critical lens, as it is our lives being affected. So to us, it seems we're in a very fundamental state of crisis, where atrocities are all too common. The application of the death penalty, mass incarceration, extrajudicial killings, rising HIV transmission, the growing popularity of compulsory drug treatment, in addition to public health emergencies such as the overdose crisis. So in the next slides, I'll touch on the areas um, that the other panelists have been speaking on, but um, I'll bring the perspective of drug users. So as most of you are aware, the world failed to reach global targets of reducing HIV transmission by 50% amongst people who inject drugs. And we know that rather than seeing a decline, we saw a 33% rise in HIV incidence. We know the drivers of HIV and also broader harm to people who use drugs, and that is criminalization, stigma, and discrimination. These factors are intersecting sectional and produce outcomes such as legal bans on interventions that we know work, people being arrested when they try and access these health services, the lack of domestic funding for comprehensive harm reduction services, and the denial of treatment for ARVs for people who inject drugs because we are considered disordered or unworthy of treatment. So a stark reality, as many of the other panelists have mentioned, is the violence and murder engendered by prohibitionist drug policy. The brutal and vicious killings of over 21,000 people who use drugs in the Philippines um, is a case in point. So for people who use drugs, the extrajudicial killings of our peers in the Philippines have unified and galvanized our community into action. Input, along with the Asian network of people who use drugs, organized a week of action with protests held around the world. We utilized human rights mechanisms. And with Ampud leading, there was also a video campaign um, started called Stop to 30 Now. So I just wanted to show some of the videos that were collected. So they're voices from the community, and the campaign was designed to take back control of the narrative um, against the juggernaut of Duterte's online propaganda. President Duterte, I have a very important message to you. What you are doing now is totally wrong. It is so inhuman. I can't believe to be there at your country as a drug user where a gun is pointed at my head and maybe I was killed now. Please stop the killing. Every human has their rights to live. President of Philippines, I've got a message for you. I'm a drug user from Russia. I have two sons and wife. So, for example, if you kill me, what you gonna say to my people, to my child? Stop killing people, it's not a solution. I hate the violence. If you're human, you'll stop it. President Duterte, I've got a message for you. We cannot stand by and let you kill our friends. Please, 
Think about your actions, they have consequences. And this is a political agenda that is playing out on people who use drugs. You need to change the policies in your country. So as Neve covered in her presentation, we need to critically reflect on the ways that drug policy has and continues to be a tool for political, social control and repression. From its beginnings, prohibitionist policies were underpinned by racism, prejudice and fear of the other. Drug control came out as a consequence of othering Chinese migrant populations, which led to the Harrison Act 1914 in the US. So the effects, as pointed out by Neva, that people of colour continue to be disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. We also know that social control cannot be separated from the rise in conservatism, populism and the anti-immigration environment that we're all facing now. Governments in these environments like to create an enemy, a scapegoat for distraction, and people who use drugs are that convenient scapegoat. There are very similar narratives underpinning the constructions of migrants and drug users within these environments. We are considered, were we constructed as op opposite to the rational, ordered and enterprising self and, and we are constructed as an anathema to ideals of citizenship. So the next point I, um, I, was, I want to speak to harm reduction at a crossroads, which was Daniel's um, presentation. So we know that the scale and reach of harm reduction is insufficient to reduce HIV transmission and accordingly insufficient to fulfill our human right to health. This is clearly a problem, but I'd also like to examine the reasons why people who use drugs don't engage in health services. As Daniel mentioned, HIV is treated as the outcome of interest when we should be looking at quality of life as the outcome of interest. As long as people who use drugs are treated as solely as vectors of transmission, the structures and practices and even the language set up to treat us will continue to fail us. Health far from being neutral is a regulatory norm and within this system we often reduce to medicalized or pathologized subjects rather than as complex persons who, whose lives and health are shaped by social and political determinants, such as criminalization, stigma, and discrimination. As long as moral biases about drug use and people who use them run unchecked within our system, we will continue to waste resources on interventions such as naltrexone which is growing popularity, um, especially amongst the general public, as an abstinence-based treatment model, but which is unacceptable to the community and has been proven to increase overdose risk. So this resurgence of recovery models, or abstinence-based models, are displacing evidence-based and rights-affirming treatment approaches such as harm reduction. As Daniel mentioned, harm reduction has always been more than a set of technical interventions. It's a philosophy and practice grounded in a non-judgmental ethos and is about meeting people where they are at. And these popularity of recovery models is an example of how moral and political biases hijack health and social sectors. On the other side of the spectrum, people who use drugs or our communities have to fight apathy and inaction. So we know in North, North America, over 60,000 people are dying each year of opioid overdoses. Political will and resources towards addressing these deaths has been, have been devastatingly slow and insufficient. It is in these contexts we need to start fighting politics with politics and apathy with political pressure. So organized drug user networks and unions play a critical role. 
In Canada, drug user networks have organi organized around the tagline, they talk, we die. After multiple actions and statements with little real practical action on the ground, communities set up underground drug consumption rooms. And following this, the Minister of Health allocated $222 million of funding. So my last reality check is the message that you're not going to be able to do this without us, without people who use drugs. Far from being irrational and compulsively disordered, communities of people who use drugs are uh, simply impatient. We're impatient to see the results, impatient to see words being put into action, impatient to see the real change in our lives, and impatient to see the end of the war on drugs. We need the science, we need medical personnel and technologies, but we also need politics that is centered on the right interests, such as saving lives. So meaningful involvement, I would stress meaningful involvement, and this should not be an afterthought. In our political landscape, um, there is the idea of infallible expert knowledge is slowly being dissolved. And I think this is both a crisis and opportunity. I think for too long, lived experience has been marginalized, and it is a critical source of knowledge. And we need to start recognizing this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very compassionate and uh, presentation thank you uh, uh, other presenters for your uh, for your introductions actually uh, on the uh, in this session uh, we heard uh, from from diff on the global perspective uh, and of um, how the current drug policies are um, uh, not only hampering health interventions but that they are bringing uh, uh, corruption that they are bringing barriers, that they are disenabling uh, people, and they, they bring violence instead of supporting uh, people. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I'm more than sure that there are questions or comments from the audience on the presentations. Please uh, come up to one of the microphones and introduce yourself and tell to whom you would like to address the question. Yes, please. No. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the wonderful presentation. My name is Rajiv Kafle. I'm from the Asian Network of People Who Use Drugs. And uh, my question is uh, to everyone uh, uh, to comment. And uh, uh, at least uh, Rodrigo Duterte is honest and he admits that he will kill each of us. But there are most leaders all over the world are worse than Duterte because they are silent. And we think that silence equals death. What have you done in your capacities to stop Duterte's war on poor people? Respond if you have, and don't respond if you think you could have done more. So, who would like to re respond on that? Have governments done enough? Um, I mean, certainly governments have not done enough to kill Duterte, and we have been calling on, on, on all governments in the world to actually condemn what he has been doing and to put more pressure to stop the killings. Um, we were a little bit encouraged that it was a very small step when we saw the International Criminal Court finally opening an, 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 a preliminary investigation into possible crimes against humanity in the Philippines. We don't know how, how this is going to work and if this is going to actually make him stop, but... but there are little steps that, with so many activists on the ground, we hope to, to keep increasing the pressure. Because, as you say, we cannot remain silent on, on these egregious human rights violations that is killing so many people. And maybe I can add that one of the other things we haven't done enough to address is the fact that it's not just people who are killed, but that there's 1.3 million people now on the government blacklist. Police have gone door to door to one third of Philippine households and basically, in some cases, tour neighborhoods with a hearse and a microphone and say, come to put yourself on the blacklist or you might find yourself in the hearse. 
this is an amazing, astonishing scale of extrajudicial confession. People are asked to sign away their rights, to submit to regular police investigation, urine testing, investigation of their friends, of their finances. And though I totally support all of the attention on the killings, many people on the list are worried that they will end up in the ranks of the dead, and there's very little support for people while they are in the situation that they are currently in. Um, and I think, am I, okay. I, I think it's also really important that we hold our own governments to account around this. So, for example, um, in the last, about 12 months ago, Liam Fox, who is one of our ministers for business, and you, should, you can imagine the UK is desperately seeking business at the moment in light of Brexit. Um, so he met with Duterte, and his actual words during that meeting was, we have shared values. That's shocking to me. And so we need to individually hold our own governments to account on how they interact with this brutal authoritarian leader. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, another question or comment, please. Здравствуйте, меня зовут Катерина Парфенюк, я из Беларуси. Hello, my name is Katerina Parfenyuk and I'm from Belarus. Позитивное движение, люди, употребляющие наркотики. A positive movement of uh, people who use drugs. Я хотела бы попросить международное сообщество, чтобы вы в будущих своих программах, идеях больше обращали внимание на наш регион. I would like to ask international society to, in the future plans, to include also um, our region, EECA region. А потому как у нас существует много проблем, например, в Беларуси есть тюрьмы в тюрьмах для наркопотребителей, то есть это резервации. Uh, for example, in Belarus, uh, we have prisons inside prisons uh, for people who use drugs. И это говорит о том, что мы на пороге Филиппин модели. And uh, this uh, issue, this case of the prisons shows that we are almost like on the, on the corner, on the stage as Philippines are right now. И я не хочу, чтобы умирали мои друзья, и мы все должны в этом поучаствовать. Да, поэтому давайте преследовать вирус, а не людей. Chase the virus! Chase the virus! Chase the virus. Love the people. Woo! Спасибо большое. Thank you. I would I would like to collect a couple of questions before we go back. Um, yeah, hi. We stay in the region. Anton. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Anton Basenko, um, a Ukrainian network of people who use drugs, and I'm proud to speak on behalf of my community of uh, drug users of Ukraine. Uh, thanks, thanks, Daniel, for this um, so brilliant presentation. And I just want to raise um, raise the problem we have. Maybe on the few sessions people already um, uh, heard about Ukraine as a, you know, some kind of success story in the region. Uh, one of the success stories is the procurement of substitution therapy medications uh, by the state budget last year um, for almost 10,000 patients. We thought we are lucky, but finally uh, we got the cheapest and the most awful medication, one of the Ukrainian producers, though we uh, raised, though we tried to attract the attention uh, of, of the Ministry of Health about the quality, because we have two different Ukrainian producers, and one we definitely know that it's really bullshit. People now feel, feel side effects. The dosage doesn't work, and the dosage is really limited for everybody. And we ask for to be involved in this, uh, somehow, in the procurement pr pr procedures, or anyway, but Ministry of Health just bought something which is cheapest. So it's like harm reduction work for people or for who? Thank you, uh, Anton. Um, I see a, uh, a couple of people leaving. Please don't leave be because we've got a special 
a moment at the very end of the, the, the session, so you won't be disappointed. Uh, oh, yes, um, please, the person at microphone six. That's complicated. Yeah, uh, uh, good afternoon. My name is Aditya. I work with uh, FHI 360, and we support the, the uh, India's government harm reduction program to innovate and uh, be more accessible to drug users. So I have a question uh, for uh, Mr. Wolf and also for Judy uh, Chang. So, uh, so with Mr. Wolf, uh, I'm I, I I'm a little confused uh, uh, about what you refer to as the therapeutic alliance and the biases uh, within that because. A lot of the innovations that we do in the public health space, I guess, do fall into those uh, biases that you mentioned. Uh, so, uh, one, could you let us know um, what are some of the innovations that you think are encouraging and uh, maybe don't fall into those biases? And uh, I didn't understand the point about the dark net uh, that you mentioned. And uh, for Judy as well, uh, if you have any examples that uh, input uh, endorses as government harm reduction programs that are on the right track uh, in terms of uh, community engagement or the way that services are provided. That will be useful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we will take two more questions and then we'll ask people to uh, respond. A uh, person over there. Hi. Thank you so much for wonderful presentations. Um, I was curious, what do you suggest we as a community continue to do to challenge drug policy norms when there seems to be sort of a willful and almost gleeful ignorance at successful interventions? Did that make sense? Okay. Uh, to whom do you address this question? Everyone. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes, please. Then uh, hello. Thank oh, you. Uh, oh, yeah, there's Lunas in, in the back. Sorry, I didn't notice you. Hmm? Yes, please. Ha okay. Have a go, Lun. Number four, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Vikas, and I am from the Asian network of people who use drugs. Um, my question is about the uh, disease model, the chronically relapsing brain disease model, as defined by WHO and used by UNODC. Um, as we are going, progressing towards this drug policy debate, I find it missing because we think that it should go parallelly because the disease model has in, in some way framed these drug policies and practices. Like if you talk about Philippines, uh, the reason behind people being killed so brutally is also like, he has openly said that people who use drugs, brains are melted, they are like, uh, that is why they should be killed. They cannot be like um, cured or anything else. So, and in a way, like drug policies are also in a way influenced by these kind of narratives. And it is not true. I am a drug user. I am not a disease person. I'm I'm not someone who needs to be fixed or cured. So, I think this question, yeah. So yeah. And this is, this is something that is missing. I, I look at most of the drug policy-related uh, documents, decriminalization, even Portugal decriminalized, but in, it, it still accepts the model of, uh, model of disease, disease of addiction, and then there, there are consequences of that model still that is faced by people who use drugs. So uh, besides Judy, Judy could add and support me because we are uh, on the same side, uh, but other rest of the other I would li like to hear from you. Why is this not included in all our documents? Why is not this taken parallelly in the drug policy debates? Because if we don't change this, then it's even difficult for us to change the drug policies. Okay, thank you. If a final question over here, a comment? Yes, please. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Anne-Marie Stengor. I'm from the WHO's regional office in for the European region. Uh, first of all, thank you to everyone for really um, amazing presentations. My question is to probably primarily Julia and uh, Daniel uh, on the simplified matrix of measuring and the big the information gap we're, ha we're, we're seeing. And I, I follow what you're saying. My question is, um, what ways forward would you suggest in filling this information gap and the knowledge gap? I've 
said and seen from a regional office perspective, the, the, the availability of information available in countries and that it can be really hard to generate sound information and without survey. I also <laughs> follow your points around the surveillance, but what would you suggest as an alternative, more complex, better matrix going forward? Thank you for your question. I suggest that we go around the panelists and ask them for their final comments in which they will include uh, answers to or comments to your questions. Let's start with Judy. Okay, well, um, first of all, it's fantastic to see people um, from drug user networks attending here. A lot of the work we do at Central European University with the support of Open Society Foundations has been training to support activists and advocates uh, within the drug user community. It really goes back to the point that I made before that how can we talk about having rational and sensible drug policy when the key stakeholders in drug policy are not engaged themselves, who are completely marginalised from these discussions in no other area of public policy. Can you imagine developing a transport policy where you didn't talk to users of the public transport? I mean, this is the situation that we have with drug policy. Um, in terms of so many thanks to all of those people who are here today, and it's wonderful to hear you very loud. Um, made me jump before, but it's fantastic that you're all here. Um, and the other point, also coming back to this question, what can we do? My position on drug policy has got to the point now, I previously worked in conflict prevention and peace building. I think the UNODC, which has overall administrative responsibility um, for drug policy, really has to be disbanded. Because the, the UNODC is responsible for such a range of activities, from pirated DVDs to protection of endangered species to drug control. And how can we talk about the UNODC having the level of expertise and capacity to deal with an issue which is about public health, which is about education, is about development? It is not a matter of security. And as long as we have drugs within the UNODC framework, then I don't see us having any advance at all on the situation that we currently have. Thank you. Daniel. I'll, I'll also talk to that question. And, and it's very difficult to think about what to do in today's world where we're seeing the politics of demonization and all these populist governments um, pushing all, the, all these repressive policies all over the world. Um, but at the same time that we're seeing all these politicians coming, coming to power and imposing and, and, and attacking the same people they were supposed to be protecting, we also saw an amazing show of, of people's power and, and, and the power of transforming realities from, from the ground. Uh, last year, we saw an amazing number of protests all around the world protesting against human rights violations and these protests leading to change. So I guess, I mean, for me, that, that, that has been the most encouraging thing of, of, of being at this conference and, and seeing all the amazing activism that is happening and networking and, and connecting to, to transform those realities. For me, that is the only way forward. Uh, bringing it from, from the bottom up and, and holding our, our authorities to account to ensure that policies are actually protecting people and transforming the realities that people are living on the ground. Thank you. Thank you for your powerful comment. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let me just speak to the question about therapeutic alliance, but also to Anton Basenko's question about quality of treatment. And I, I don't think it's just about the medicine. It's about medicine. It's about needles that are provided by needle exchange. It's about the interaction in clinics that if you don't ask the people who are using the services how it's going and you have no feedback loop, then you don't know when you've lost the, the confidence or the benefit to the people that you're trying to reach. So it may, therapeutic alliance is nothing more than saying to people, I want to work with you, not do something to you. How can we work together? What do you want from this service? And then changing it in response. And to the point about the dark net, you know, old ways of outreach, sometimes you get wedded to doing the same thing. This is what we do. We used to go to an open drug scene. And then even when there is no longer an open drug scene, outreach workers are sitting there thinking, well, how do I reach people? So the dark net example was just some activists work with actual providers, platforms on the darknet who are dealing drugs on the darknet to say, can we use your platform to provide harm reduction information and supplies to people because we can no longer reach people in the street. So we can't just keep doing the same thing again and again in the same way that drug use, drug dealing, drug trafficking is fluid. So harm reduction programs also need to be fluid and to ask people what they need in designing the programs. Thank you. Uh, Neve. Um, yeah, I'm going to come back on the disease model. Um, I actually think it's probably a bit bullshitty, if I'm honest. Sorry for swearing on stage. But 
The reality is when we go out into the community to deliver the legal services that we do to people who use drugs, it is inextricably linked to poverty. So if it was a disease, the disease is, is completely, you know, it doesn't choose what class it goes after, but the people that we see the police going after are the people who are in, engaged in community treatment services are very much the kind of the, the, the profile of those that nationally represent kind of people who have, uh, who would be defined as problematic users. And so I think we need to challenge that and need to talk about that. It's not about the drugs all the time, that actually structural poverty, structural racism are some of the issues that are fundamentally at the core of the experience of people who use drugs. And that until we address those issues, that we cannot in any way really have a drug policy that respects individuals and the human dignity of people who use drugs. Also, I'd like to talk about pleasure. You know, drugs are really pleasurable. Lots of people use them for lots of sensible reasons. They self-medicate, you know, they're stressed out, they smoke cannabis. These are things that we need to challenge. We need to challenge the narrative of drugs being bad. So that's where I will go. Thank you. And a final comment from Judy. Um, so I think I'll just answer to the question about what do good harm reduction services look like. Um, so... As a service user, you know, I think one of the most, um, well, the first point of entry is a program being low threshold. Um, so, you know, a lot of times with a lot of programs, they'll make you jump through all these loopholes, really bureaucratic procedures, waiting times, and, you know, by that time, you've lost your motivation to engage. Um, and then once you're in the program, you know, flexibility and just the basic recognition that people who use drugs have lives and, um, you know, you should, we, our time and our lives should be valued. You know, a lot of the times with these services, they expect, you know, there's long waiting times, they're very um, far away, and they don't really, res you know, respect you as a service user. Um, Takeaway doses, obviously, is a very important issue also. Um, but, yes, underlying all of this is just basic respect and um, you know, that you know when you go into treatment, you won't be stigmatized and discriminated within healthcare settings. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Then I, th then I think that uh, after these pre presentations on the, the situation on, uh, of uh, HIV, HIV responses and how drug policies are not contributing to that, uh, it's also t uh, good to have a, a, a moment of celebration of the things that we're doing pretty well um, and there are there's quite a lot uh, um, but some of them need to be highlighted and I think that's why I would like to uh, invite um, Marina Klein uh, to the stage uh, Marina will uh, lead uh, will hand the, um, an award to a, a couple of presenters of this uh, presentation and this will also be done by um, uh, Ms. Dreyfus um, Ms. Dreyfus is the co-chair of this session. If, uh, if you have a co-chair like her, life is very easy. Um, she's the former president of the, uh, Switzerland and an extraordinary leader in sensible uh, and humane drug policies. Thank you. Yes, we have a special event to celebrate now and I am happy to make it in front of this audience and after this so important panel you just had. We know 37 million people are living with HIV in the world. What we don't know generally is that 71 million persons are estimated to be living with the hepatitis C virus. The silent epidemic is now really appearing about what it is and threatening the life of so many people. And the co-infection between HIV and HCV is a real problem all over the world. But for people who inject drugs, it is disproportionately that they are affected by HIV and HCV with more half of the co-infection burden being made upon people who inject drugs. The prevalence of HCV co-infection is high as 82% and more. 
And we know needle and syringe program and opioid substitution therapy coverage is too low to uh, avoid this uh, dissemination, and it has to be scaled up. We know that it works. We know that it is easy to implement. We know also that the will to do so is not enough. WHO has put some uh, targets uh, to fight against, uh, against HCV, but let me tell that as long as the PVD, PVID people are not considered as priority population, these uh, efforts will not achieve their aims. I give now the floor to uh, Marina Klein to give the price of, uh, how is it called? The IAS Injecting Drug Use Research Prices. Thank, thank you very much. Um, yeah, and it's really a great pleasure on behalf of the International AIDS Society, Governing Council, and the co-infections and comorbidities working group in particular, of which I've co-led with Jürgen Rokstro over the last uh, six years, uh, to inaugurate these three prizes that we will be awarding today, which are actually worth $2,000 US. And they're in developed, uh, in addition to other prizes that the IS has started to give, to incentivize research uh, to address important research questions in undermet areas, and in particular in these prizes around in, uh, hepatitis C infection and HIV co-infection in people who inject drugs in particular. And in particular, we wish to focus on interdisciplinary research on drug dependence, harm reduction, and other drug policy issues that impact the lives of people living with HIV and hepatitis C. So I'm really proud today to uh, award these three prizes uh, to the following uh, people who, if they could come on stage as I introduce them, it would be appreciated. Stella Uugana of Nigeria for her abstract entitled Prevalence and Correlates of Knowledgeable of knowledge of HBV and HCV infection among people who inject drugs in Lagos, Nigeria. Brooke West, <laughs> ah, here she comes, of the United States for her abstract entitled Causes and Predictors of Mortality among people who inject drugs in Tijuana between 2011 and 2017. And Ibert Schortz of the Netherlands for his abstract entitled study on drug consumption rooms, on current practice and future capacity to address communicable diseases like hepatitis C. So please uh, join me in congratulating them for their contributions to the injection drug use research, uh, which we really hope to see much more of in, integrated into this conference. And I think today's panel was an excellent uh, evidence that this is not only needed but a lots of room for more research to inform our practice and policies.
Okay. Uh, with that, I, with this ceremony, um, I would like to close this session. I would like to uh, have a round of applause for the wonderful presenters. I would like to have an uh, applause for you, for uh, the people coming from all over the world, uh, uh, from the different uh, disciplines, uh, activists, people from science, people from governments, uh, to come over. I would like to encourage you to continue your work, your, your dialogues, keep on writing your reports, keep on uh, continuing uh, your actions like this. And, um, I wish you all the best during this conference, and I hope to have to, uh, that you have a wonderful stay um, in Amsterdam. <laughs>